Let's go to Ron Chapman right now. He is a federal criminal defense attorney. He joins us now live. And Ron, uh, the former president's attorney, I want to get to that theater right now between what happens inside the courtroom, the court of public opinion, and the court of law. The former president's attorney, John Laurel, mm -hmm. saying this indictment is an attack on free speech and political advocacy. Is that really the case here? Is that the legal strategy or is that the public opinion strategy? I think it's going to be both. So when Jack Smith indicted this case, he really focused on the statements of Donald Trump and his knowledge of the falsity of those statements. But interestingly, if you look at the first part of the indictment, Jack Smith acknowledges that Donald Trump is allowed to say false things, but what he can't do is plot to overthrow the government. So Donald Trump's defense strategy is going to be, I made statements I thought were true, but where that crosses the line into criminal behavior is when those statements are designed to involve a conspiracy uh, to essentially overthrow the election. Ron, something we just found out, uh, the former president going into the courtroom itself at 351, nine minutes early, nine minutes before his arraignment, as someone who represents defendants, what do you tell them about making sure you're on time and also making sure that you do not anger the judge this early on? Well, absolutely. Nine minutes early is not early enough for me. I typically have my clients show up at least a half hour early to court, but I understand Donald Trump's travel plans may be a little different than my clients. Um, the, the counseling that's going to go on before this hearing is this is not Judge Cannon. This is Judge Chuckin. Judge Chuckin, while she was a former public defender, she is also somebody who will not tolerate the extrajudicial dangerous statements that Donald Trump has likely been making. I don't know if a gag order would be sought in this case, but if it was, she would give fair consideration to whether or not Donald Trump's statements need to be curtailed if they impact the judicial process. And that's different than a restraint on free speech. Uh, defendants aren't allowed to try to impact their trial based on their extrajudicial statements. And I, I fear Trump may try to cross that line at some point. I want to chime in here with a question because one of the things that I remembered from the prosecution side that we've heard our legal experts talking about was how they would have to prove, and I wrote this down because it stood out, what was in his head and what was in his heart uh, to move forward with their prosecution from a defense perspective. Is there concern about their ability to do that? Are they worried about uh, them being able to pull off that prosecution? That's exactly where I'm going if I'm Donald Trump's uh, defense team. I'm going to try to show that the government can't prove knowledge in this case, that Donald Trump's actions were designed to get the people to riot on January 6th, and they weren't designed to do anything unlawful with respect to the election. And that's going to be the difficult thing for Jack Smith to do. He not only has to show that these statements were false, but he has to show that these statements were designed to get people to interfere with the election. I think what's going to be particularly important here is the testimony of Eastman, of Giuliani, and of other attorneys and the advice that they provided. Now, going a little bit further into this, the cross-examination of those same people is going to be incredibly important because we all know those three people I just named spent a lot of time on other national news network saying the same kind of statements that Donald Trump did. He's going to say, I was in an inner, inner circle echo chamber and I was relying on my advice of counsel. And that's why the mind and the guilty mind is a very important aspect of this case. Ron, the former president's attorneys are actually taking to the airwaves and they are saying that they do not believe that he has a strong case. One, in fact, uh, used the street vernacular, and I won't use it, but he said it does not look good. That being the, the case, I know that normally you do not advise a client to take the stand, but in this case, because the former president is trying to influence the court of public opinion, what does he stand to lose? Well, if I'm Donald Trump's counsel, he stays as far away from the stand as humanly possible. There's just simply too much cross-examination material. I think that you can make up Donald Trump's mindset and you can put on a lot of his defenses, including the advice of counsel defense, based on the information that's provided. One benefit that somebody who's a former president has is the fact that nearly everything is documented. That's a benefit and a detriment for Donald Trump. But what that means is many of his statements may be able to come into evidence here without him actually getting on the witness stand. Now, the question is, will Trump listen to his lawyers? Will he say, yeah, I'd rather try to have a shot at this without getting on the witness stand? Or is he going to use this trial in another effort to try to grandstand? And even if he's going down in flames, try to garner the support 
of his base and his constituents through testimony in open federal court. The question is, will Trump listen to his lawyers? That is our criminal defense attorney and expert, Ron Chapman. Ron, as always, thanks for being with us.